In 73 BC, a rebellion started by a handful of escaped gladiators erupted close to the heart of the Italian peninsula. In less than three years, the number of rebels grew from less than a hundred men to hundreds of thousands who were now threatening the security of Rome itself. Their leader, a gladiator by the name of Spartacus, became one of the most recognizable figures of antiquity and a national hero in some parts of the world, despite very little information about his background or agenda. What allowed the rebellion to grow to such an unimaginable magnitude? Who was Spartacus and what was his end goal? Was he an ancient freedom fighter looking to bring justice to the many slaves of the Roman Republic? Or was he simply a tyrant taking advantage of a politically unstable Rome? This is a documentary about Spartacus and the Third Servile War. In order to figure out the reason and motives behind Spartacus' rebellion, we need to understand the political situation in Rome at the time when it broke out, and its context from the Roman point of view. To do that, we need to go back to the end of the Punic Wars. With the victory over Carthage and the destruction of their capital, Rome defeated its only considerable foe and established itself as the undisputed hegemon of the Mediterranean. With the increasing number of successful Roman campaigns in new territories, more and more wealth was pouring into the coffers of the Republic, thanks to the reparations, tributes, and taxes coming from their defeated enemies. However, there was a significant problem with that. The vast majority of this newly acquired wealth was going into the pockets of the Roman elites, leading to an ever-increasing divide between Rome's rich and poor. During the latter half of the 2nd century BC, Rome's middle class was coming incrementally closer to extinction. The reason for this was that the incorporation of new lands into the Republic had drastically changed the economic landscape in Rome. By this point, it had become much more lucrative to import a variety of goods than to produce them, and the Italian peninsula was becoming increasingly reliant on cheap slave labor for its agriculture. Because of this, many Italic farmers found themselves unable to support themselves financially and were forced to sell their properties, which in turn were purchased by oligarchs who already possessed huge plots of land. It was obvious that the Roman Republic was in a dire need of new economic policies. Eventually, two brothers rose to the occasion. Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus were two politicians elected to represent the interests of the Roman plebeians. They introduced new laws which sought to redistribute lands from the Roman aristocracy to Rome's impoverished by putting a limit on how much land a single individual could hold. This was a seemingly simple solution to a major issue. In reality, however, the Gracchi reforms did little to no good, as many members of the rich and influential Roman aristocracy found ways to circumnavigate the new laws or simply ignore them, not fearing any potential consequences. The Gracchi brothers were eventually assassinated by conservatives who fiercely opposed their reforms, marking the beginning of an era of unprecedented political violence in the Roman Republic. Less than two decades after the murder of Gaius Gracchus, a populist consul rose to prominence and tried to succeed where the Gracchi brothers had failed. His name was Gaius Marius, and he was an esteemed Roman statesman with an outstanding military career. The socio-economic crisis in the Roman Republic had taken its toll on the military as well. Before the reforms of Marius, there were strict requirements for entering the Roman army. In order for a Roman man to serve in the military, he was required to own property worth a certain amount and to be able to afford his own military equipment. 
As Rome's influence grew, so did the need for a numerous and well-trained armed force. But as the middle class was getting poorer, there were fewer and fewer men who could enlist in the military. The Marian reforms proposed a solution to Rome's economic and military crisis at the same time. Marius introduced many meaningful changes to the structure of the Roman army and the way that it functioned. But most importantly, thanks to his reforms, now every man with a citizen status could enlist in the military. Not only would they be paid a salary regardless of whether or not Rome was at war, but after 16 years of service, they would be entitled to retire and be granted a plot of land that they could farm. These reforms made Marius incredibly popular with the Roman peasants, who were now joining the military to serve under his banner. Unsurprisingly, just like the Gracchi brothers, Marius was extremely unpopular with the conservatives who wanted to protect the interests of the Roman elite. Furthermore, the political instability created tensions between Rome and its allies in the Italian peninsula who felt like the Roman policies were disproportionately favoring Roman citizens and sought equal status. The tension escalated into a civil war which Rome managed to win. But during the conflict, a radical conservative general backed by the Roman aristocracy and the Senate outshone Marius and proved himself as an even more capable commander. His name was Lucius Cornelius Sulla, and two civil wars broke out between his and Marius' supporters. Sulla receiving support from the monumentally wealthy Roman aristocracy eventually came out on top and initiated violence that was once again unprecedented in the history of the Republic. Marius and his most notable followers were purged in a series of political assassinations, shutting down most political discourse in the Roman capital. Judging by the severity of this political conflict, it was clear that the Roman Republic was nearing its end as people knew it. In fact, at the time of Sulla's victory, one of Marius' supporters, a young Julius Caesar, had already started his political career. It's not hard to imagine why a slave revolt like the one led by Spartacus would occur. The socio-economic divide in Italy was so severe that there were slaves who were living lavishly compared to the hard-working peasants who had lost their properties and were failing to make ends meet. The educated and literate slaves living in the cities were enjoying very comfortable lives, working as private tutors and doctors for example. There was no resentment towards the Romans from this group of people as all of their needs were fulfilled despite not having a citizen status. In contrast, the picture in the Italian countryside was drastically different. Slaves working on farms had to do hard physical labor all day and spend the rest of their time often confined within cramped cells where they lived together. The only slaves in the countryside who enjoyed any semblance of liberty were herders who walked several kilometers a day while doing their job. Spartacus's rebellion is known as the Third Servile War, and it was preceded by two similar rebellions, all within the span of a century. By the start of the first century BC, slaves would make up between 30 and 40 percent of the population of the Italian peninsula, with roughly one-fourth of these slaves living in cities. The majority of slaves were experiencing the harsh conditions of the countryside. It is no coincidence that all of the servile revolts started in southern Italy, where most of the peninsula's agriculture was located, and hence there was a higher concentration of slaves. But it would not be fair to call these wars slave rebellions. While the majority of rebels participating in them were indeed slaves, Roman chroniclers of the time know that there were Roman citizens who were driven to such extreme misery that they were willing to join the ranks of a slave army as a last resort to improve their well-being and living conditions. Spartacus' war was by far the most successful of the three, a fact which could be attributed to the military situation of the Italian peninsula at the time. In 73 BC, when Spartacus and his fellow gladiators escaped the school of Batiatas in Capua, the Roman Republic was waging wars on two fronts. To the west, the Romans were occupied with the last remnants of the Marian faction, fighting a fierce guerrilla war against a cunning general named Sertorius. To the east, the Romans were facing a familiar enemy in King Mithridates of Pontus in a series of wars spanning over the course of more than a decade. The Republic's military efforts were entirely focused on these two conflicts. Rome's best generals alongside their most capable troops were assigned to either one of these two campaigns. 
This was the perfect moment for Spartacus to start raising havoc less than 200 kilometers away from the heart of the Roman Republic. Over two millennia after his death, Spartacus remains a prominent figure from ancient Roman history. Nevertheless, very little is known about his life prior to his enslavement and gladiator days. Ancient historians unanimously agree that Spartacus was of Thracian origin. The rest of the information that we have about him relies on various degrees of speculation. Most likely he was a Thracian auxiliary, fighting alongside the Roman army as a part of a Thracian light cavalry force, possibly under the command of Sulla. The reason for his enslavement is his possible desertion and later capture by the Roman army. His year of birth is unknown, but he was most likely in his 30s at the start of the Third Servile War. Given his ethnic origin, he likely fought in the style of Thryax, a gladiator class meant to loosely resemble the stereotype of a Thracian warrior. Judging by the fact that he had spent several years fighting as a gladiator before escaping in his role as a leader of the revolt, Spartacus was likely a champion of his ludus and well respected among his fellow gladiators. Spartacus' name has provoked some historians to also speculate that he belonged to the Thracian nobility. There were several Odrysian kings bearing similar names, such as Spartokas or Sparatokas. Such claims can easily be challenged, however, as there is no evidence to suggest that these names were reserved for the Thracian nobility. Furthermore, Spartacus's complete lack of notoriety prior to his escape would also suggest that he was not a man of particular importance. Nevertheless, Spartacus's prior military experience and familiarity with the inner workings of the Roman military machine would distinguish him from the leaders of the first two servile wars and give him a notable advantage when fighting the Romans. It is important to note that while Spartacus was the most noteworthy figure of the Third Servile War, he was most likely not the sole leader of the Servile Army, but rather an equal to several other men. We know the names of four of them, Crixus, Gannicus, Animaeus, and Castus. Similar to Spartacus, very little is known about them other than the fact that they were gladiators, most probably from the same ludus as Spartacus. Instead of Thracians, however, most, if not all of them, came from a Celtic or Gallic background. Given their gladiator status, each of these men was a slave, but it is important to refute a few myths about the gladiator lifestyle. The everyday life of a gladiator included a wide variety of amenities that slaves from the countryside could not enjoy. For starters, gladiators were highly valued slaves, whose lives were considered far more important than those of many others. Contrary to how they are portrayed in modern culture, gladiatorial fights were rarely fought to the death, and fights advertised as such received large amounts of hype behind them, indicating that they were not the norm. Of course, gladiators were still at risk when entering the arena. The fights were not staged, and they involved two or more men engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with razor-sharp weapons. Due to this fact, it was not uncommon for a gladiator to die as a result of an infection from a wound received in the arena, or a fracture which would prove fatal. Nevertheless, the majority of deaths which happened in the arenas were rather ceremonial executions of enemies of the Republic, the so-called Damnati. Additionally, the ancient sources tell us that a gladiator would usually fight only once or twice per year, similarly to the combat sports athletes of today. There are more similarities which can be drawn between these two groups of people. The gladiators were entitled to the best healthcare available at the time, ensuring that they were in good health before entering the arena and treating any injuries acquired while fighting. They were also fed a high-calorie diet, which was perceived to be the most effective diet for athletes at the time. And most importantly, gladiatorial fights were not simply entertainment. There was a sacred element to them, and they were perceived as an honorable and glorious activity by the Romans. In fact, many gladiators did not become such forcibly, but rather volunteered to revoke their status of freemen in search of fame and glory in the sands of the Roman arenas. Plutarch, the main historian describing the events of the Third Servile War, also calls it the Gladiator War. But this term could be deceptive, as the revolt which was started by a handful of gladiator fugitives soon welcomed various kinds of slaves within its ranks. 
Nevertheless, gladiators were given a priority in receiving high-ranking positions, since most of them came from a military background and at the very least were trained in armed combat. But one problem quickly became evident for the leaders of the rebel army. The majority of slaves on the Italian peninsula were Gauls and Germans, but the overall ethnic diversity of the servile army quickly became a cause for concern. Aside from the obvious issue of communication, there were several other potential logistical difficulties. For one, the vast majority of the army consisted of manual laborers with no military training whatsoever. It would be a burdensome task to teach these people how to stay in formation, let alone how to fight the enemy in the heat of battle. But the bigger issue facing the leaders of the revolt was the tension between the different ethnicities within it and their wildly different views of what the goal of the rebellion should be. While being common enemies of the Romans, the Gauls and the Germans generally disliked each other as there were cultural differences between them and they practiced different religions. Moreover, the circumstances around the enslavement of the different people were different, hence why they had different ideas for what they wanted to achieve. For example, some of the Germans and Gauls captured during the Cimbrian War likely found themselves under Spartacus's command. It is not hard to imagine that these men's top priority was seeking revenge against Rome for their bitter defeats. Others who did not fight in the war were probably more concerned with pillaging and sacking as much as possible. And of course, there were those who simply wanted to flee from the Romans and live the rest of their lives freely. These varying goals and attitudes among the rebels would pose a significant challenge for the leaders when it came to making important strategic decisions. Undoubtedly a lot of compromises needed to be made in order to appease these different factions within the revolt. This is an important factor to keep in mind when looking at the chronology of the Third Servile War. In the summer of 73 BC, the gladiators from the school of Lentulus Batiatus were vigorously training for the Roman Games, one of the largest festivals in ancient Rome. The city of Capua had a reputation of producing some of the best champions fighting in the arenas of the Roman Republic, and Batiatus himself was one of the most influential Lenistas in the city. But while the preparations for the upcoming games were going according to plan, rumors of a potential riot among the gladiators reached Batiatus, who acted with haste by drastically increasing the number of guards protecting his residence. Indeed, only a few hours later, led by one of his champions, Spartacus, his gladiators were attacking the guards with makeshift weapons and implements which they had stolen from Batiatus's kitchen. The fighting continued for several hours, but the outstanding combat ability of the gladiators, alongside their physical prowess, allowed them to overpower the guards and make their way out of Batiatus' quarters, many losing their lives in the process. And just like that, around 80 gladiators had fought their way to freedom and were now running amok in the streets of Capua. Knowing that the Roman authorities were on their heels, the gladiators needed to decide on their next move quickly. By a stroke of luck, they stumbled upon a shipment of brand new gladiator equipment, which they quickly seized. Shortly after, they decided what their next move was going to be. They would head towards Mount Vesuvius, where they could establish a camp without any Roman settlements in their close proximity. From there, they would run small raids on the Romans, freeing more slaves in the process, as well as gathering supplies while their numbers grew. In the next following months, the rebellion grew faster than the gladiators could have predicted. They ran attacks on Roman villas in the countryside, freeing many slaves in the process, but as news of the gladiator revolt spread wider and wider, many of Rome's impoverished flocked to join them willingly, including many women and children. Yet Spartacus and his men knew that it was only a matter of time before they would have to meet the Romans on the battlefield, so they focused their efforts on training the newly recruited slaves how to stay in formation and fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat while creating as much military equipment as possible from makeshift materials. The Romans were not alerted by the actions of the rebels yet. The revolt was still in its infancy and it was not posing a large threat to Rome in any way. 
Furthermore, in the eyes of the Romans there was no glory in fighting rebels. Quashing rebellions was seen as more of a chore than a military endeavor. No self-respecting high-ranking Roman commander would be willing to take up such a thankless task since there was nothing to gain from it. This is why a praetor with little to no military experience by the name of Gaius Claudius Glaber was tasked with putting down the rebellion. An army of around 3,000 soldiers was assembled to serve under his command. But these soldiers were men who were far from their prime. Glaber's army consisted of mostly retired Roman troops or completely green recruits with low morale who looked at their task as more of a trip to the southern Italian countryside than a military expedition. Once he arrived at Mount Vesuvius, Glaber's plan was simple. It would besiege the camp of the rebels and completely cut off their supply until they either die of starvation or surrender. This is the moment when Spartacus had to show that he was a capable commander. Anticipating a similar outcome, Spartacus had prepared his men for the occasion. Small, light cavalry contingents were assembled, possibly led by other Thracians, who were renowned for fielding some of the best light cavalrymen of the ancient world. These light cavalrymen were supposed to serve a reconnaissance role, scout the Roman positions, and constantly gather information on their enemy. This allowed Spartacus to carefully plan an attack on the Roman camp. The rebels swiftly attacked during the night, catching the Romans completely off guard. The attack was possibly over in minutes, with many of the Romans slaughtered before they could even equip their armor and weapons. Glaber barely escaped, only to be remembered in shame for the rest of his life. Capturing the entire equipment of the Roman camp, Spartacus and his men were now in a much better position than they had been in before Glaber's arrival. When news of Glaber's defeat reached Rome, the Senate continued to overlook the rebellion. The defeat was just a minor military blunder, caused by the complete incompetence of an inexperienced Roman commander. Nevertheless, they were willing to throw a more sizable and organized army at Spartacus, this time led by another praetor named Publius Verinius. Verinius would repeat many of Glaber's mistakes. For one, he decided to split his troops, with the majority of them being commanded by two of his subordinates. Being inexperienced commanders, they once again completely ignored the importance of information gathering and reconnaissance and were ambushed by rebel troops, losing their lives in the process. With the remaining force, Verinius decided to besiege the rebel camp near Mount Vesuvius, just like Glaber had done before him. Spartacus was once again able to use the superior knowledge of the tactical situation to fool the Romans, this time not by ambushing them, but by evacuating his entire force under the cover of night. The rebels set up decoys to make it appear as if the camp was guarded as usual, and all the fires were left to blaze, to create the illusion that nothing was out of the ordinary. In the morning, the Romans realized that the figures that appeared to be guarding the camp were dummies, equipped with helmets and armor, and that there was no one left there. With the whole of southern Italy open for the servile army, uncontested they sacked the nearby cities of Nola and Nuceria, engaging in unprecedented levels of cruelty and raiding on a much larger scale than before. Eventually the remainder of Varinius' force was defeated and the rebels continued southward to the province of Lucania where they sacked the city of Metapontum. They reached Thurii, which they decided to make into a temporary base. The choice to establish a base in Thurii was not purposeless. The city was renowned for its large surplus of iron and it was the largest manufacturer of military equipment in southern Italy. Despite defeating two Roman armies and appropriating a lot of their equipment, the growing number of rebel troops created an ever-increasing shortage of weapons and armor. In the following months, the forges of Thuria were working at full capacity to equip the rebel army, while new recruits continued to join their ranks in droves. After the defeat of the Praetorian armies, the Senate finally decided to take more drastic measures in order to defeat Spartacus and his followers. The two acting consuls of the Republic were given one legion each to quash the rebellion once and for all. Meanwhile, the disagreements between the different factions of the rebellion had reached their peak. Crixus and Spartacus, unable to agree on what their next move should be, decided to go their separate ways. If the ancient sources are to be believed, Spartacus' plan was to head north until reaching the province of Cisalpine Gaul, where his army would disperse, with the Gauls and the Germans crossing the Alps and returning to their homelands, while the Thracians, for example, would head east to the Balkan Peninsula. 
This proposition was not tempting for many of the rebels, however, since many of them were second or even third generation slaves and they had never been to their ethnic homelands. They didn't belong to a certain tribe and possibly didn't even speak their native language. For these people, crossing the Alps was not an option because they had nowhere to go. Furthermore, the veterans of the Cimbrian War also likely did not want to side with Spartacus. These men were not seeking to return to their homelands and rebuild their lives, but they wanted to avenge their defeat by making the Romans suffer as much as possible. Crixus offered an alternative for these people. He and his men would split from the rest of the rebels and they would continue to ravage the Italian peninsula for as long as possible, fighting the Romans tooth and nail. Leaving the city of Thurii, Spartacus with the majority of rebels under his command headed north while Crixus and his smaller group of followers headed to the northeast. Lucius Gellius Publicola, one of the Roman consuls spent Crixus in Apulia when his legionaries in the Battle of Mount Gorgano. Crixus's men likely outnumbered the Romans, but facing a Roman legion in an open field battle for the first time proved too much for the rebel army, who were defeated despite fighting almost to the last man. Nevertheless, Crixus and his followers died exactly how they wanted to, fighting the Romans with a sword in hand. The death of Crixus undoubtedly raised the morale of the Roman troops. This was the first Roman victory of the entire war but the Romans still had to deal with the majority of the rebel troops, who were led by an arguably more capable commander. Spartacus headed towards Cisalpine Gaul, avoiding major routes in order to not engage the Romans unnecessarily. The two Roman consuls had taken positions in the Apennines in order to block the rebel force before it could reach Cisalpine Gaul. But once again the Roman commanders had made a crucial mistake. While the two armies were deployed close to each other, no means of communication were established between them. This allowed Spartacus to march on the army of Lentulus Claudianus, the less experienced commander of the two consuls. The rebel troops completely overwhelmed the Romans with their superior numbers and routed them. Having no intel of the situation, Publicola did not move his troops to reinforce his fellow consul. After defeating Claudianus, Spartacus quickly attacked Publicola's legion in the same manner, gaining yet another victory over the Romans. Despite facing well-trained and well-equipped Roman regulars for the first time, the servile army showed that it was a force to be reckoned with. With their vastly superior numbers, an army mostly comprised of men who had no military training just a few months earlier, was now capable of facing Roman legions in open field battles and defeating them. There was one final obstacle in front of Spartacus before he could reach the Alps. Upon entering Cisalpine Gaul, the rebels led by Spartacus had reached a number of over 100,000, including women and children according to the ancient sources. Upon defeating the two Roman consuls, Spartacus wasted no time and quickly headed towards Mutina, the capital city of Cisalpine Gaul. There was one legion stationed in the province, but it was spread over the entire region. Less than a week later, Spartacus was at the gates of the Cisalpine capital. Having insufficient time to prepare for the attack, the proconsul of the province could not regroup his men and only had a small force at his capital. Once again, the rebels overwhelmed the Romans with their superior numbers and defeated them. Spartacus was finally in front of the Alps. Having reached his ultimate destination, as unlikely as it seemed, from a handful of gladiators escaping the school of Batiatus, Spartacus' followers had managed to grow in size enough to defeat tens of thousands of Roman troops. The war was seemingly won. The rebels were going to disperse and go to their homes. Spartacus' next decision is unquestionably the most crucial one of the entire war, but it is also one of the most unexpected. Instead of marching through the Alps, the rebels turned around and marched south. The reasons behind this move remain unknown to this day and we will likely never know the rationale for making it. But it is possible that upon reaching the Alps, the slaves realized that marching through them was not as easy as they had thought it would be. Perhaps acknowledging that the harsh climate of the region would likely prove fatal for many of the women and children that stood alongside Spartacus, the rebels decided to seek another way out. Conversely, it is possible that after defeating the Romans in such a dominant fashion, the once calm and collected Thracian had become intoxicated by his success and persuaded his followers that he could bring down Rome itself. 
The ancient Roman sources do not even agree if the decision was Spartacus's idea in the first place. But whatever the truth may be, turning south marked the beginning of the end of the Third Servile War and effectively gave Spartacus and his followers a death sentence. Upon marching south, the rebels met the remains of the consular army and defeated it once again at the Battle of Pisenum. Spartacus then marched towards Rome, but just as the Eternal City was within his grasp, he decided not to attack. Once again, it is uncertain why the former Thracian gladiator was indecisive when it mattered the most. But the Roman historian speculated that he and his men were either intimidated by the heavily fortified walls of the city, or that Spartacus simply felt like he wasn't ready to deal a final blow to the Romans. He instead decided to once again head south and return to his old base in Thurii. Meanwhile in Rome, a new figure emerged as the next man who would try to put down the rebellion. His name was Marcus Licinius Crassus, and Plutarch describes him as the richest man in Rome. While many modern historians disagree with this particular description, it is undeniable that Crassus possessed immense wealth and was the largest estate owner of the Republic at the time. Crassus was the perfect nemesis for Spartacus due to the fact that he was a direct stakeholder in the war. Crassus had built his wealth in a short amount of time and he was involved in many shady dealings on the Roman economic landscape. But most importantly, he relied on a huge number of slaves to work on his countless estates and was without a doubt the largest slave owner in the whole Roman Republic. Many of his possibly tens of thousands of slaves were now fighting shoulder to shoulder with Spartacus. Furthermore, he required no monetary assistance from the Senate in his endeavor. He raised six legions using his personal resources and was given the remains of the consular army. The force that Crassus commanded was not only monumental in its size, but he was also determined not to repeat the mistakes of his predecessors, taking a much more meticulous approach and putting an emphasis on reconnaissance. Two of his legions were commanded by a man named Mumius, who was given explicit orders not to engage any rebel force under any circumstances. Nevertheless, Mumius decided that he was in an advantageous position and attacked a small contingent of rebel troops, falling into a trap set by Spartacus. Realizing that they were ambushed, the Romans threw down their weapons and fled. This event absolutely infuriated Crassus, and he wanted to discipline his troops and set an example for his men to never defy his orders. To do this, he used an exceptionally brutal method, called decimation, where a cohort is selected to be punished, divided into groups of 10 people, with one of them being randomly chosen to be beaten to death by the other 9. This drastic measure had not been used for over a century, but according to the ancient sources, the execution of 50 legionaries was tremendously effective in raising the morale of the Roman troops. After this event, Crassus finally started to gain the upper hand against Spartacus, defeating his troops in several engagements and pushing his army to the coast of Brutium. Seeing that Spartacus could not retreat further south, the Romans erected fortifications north of the rebel positions coast to coast, effectively putting the rebels under siege. Realizing the severity of the situation, Spartacus decided to make a final attempt to gain the upper hand. The coast of Sicily was less than 10 kilometers away from his position. The island was densely populated by slaves, many of whom would eagerly join Spartacus once they learned of his arrival. Perhaps if he could find a way to transport his troops to Sicily, he could expand the size of his army and once again stand a fighting chance against Crassus. Of course, Spartacus did not have the resources to build a fleet of his own, so instead, he decided to seek help from the Cilician pirates who were constantly raiding the southern coast of Italy. He struck a deal with them, but they never showed up to honor their part of the deal. It is unknown why the pirates betrayed Spartacus, but there are two possible reasons. They were either bribed by Crassus, who learned of the deal in time and offered a larger sum of money to the pirates not to transport the rebels, or the pirates never intended to help Spartacus, knowing that their small and agile ships were not suitable for transporting a mass of close to 100,000 people. In the winter of 71 BC, as a final act of desperation, Spartacus tried to negotiate with Crassus, who was completely relentless at this point. Eventually, the Thracians saw no other way but to fight the Romans on disadvantageous terms. A 
Against the odds, the rebels managed to gain one final victory over the Romans, breaking through their lines, allowing them to escape north. However, they achieved this victory at a great cost. Many men died in the engagement, while over 10,000 others did not manage to escape alongside the main force and were cut down by the Romans, including Gannicus and Castus. Spartacus made a last-ditch effort to once again reach the Alpine goal and escape the Roman Republic, but his last hopes were crushed long before he could reach the Alpine goal, as he realized he was now stuck between three Roman armies. Aside from the legions of Crassus, who were in full pursuit, Pompey, arguably Rome's most esteemed general, was now marching through southern Italy alongside his veteran legionnaires returning from Iberia. In addition to this, the Senate in Rome had recalled another general to Italy, Marcus Terentius Lucullus, the proconsul of Macedonia, who was stationed in Brundisium, leading four legions of his own. Spartacus realized that he and his followers would soon be dead, but he was not going down without a fight. Following the example of Crixus, he and his men would fight the Romans to the death. They just needed to decide which of the three armies they could do the most damage to. Pompey was the least appealing option. Spartacus had never faced a general of the caliber of Pompey, and his Iberian veterans were far more disciplined and experienced than any other army that he had faced before. Lucullus was a general that he and his men were not familiar with, so Crassus was the most obvious choice. The rebels turned around to face Crassus in one final battle. The Battle of Silarius River was a crushing defeat for the servile rebels. Most of them were killed on the battlefield, but 6,000 rebel captives were crucified by Crassus in the largest mass execution of antiquity. The few thousand rebels that survived were promptly caught and killed by Pompey, putting an end to the Third Servile War. The war ended with a victory for Rome, but not a victory for Crassus. He had invested so much of his personal resources, hoping to reap all the political benefits that came from putting down the rebellion in order to advance his political career. He was given credit for defeating Spartacus, but at the end of the day he felt humiliated as he had to share his glory with Pompey, his political rival, who was given credit for putting an end to the rebellion, despite only fighting the last pockets of resistance after Crassus' decisive victory. In his final days, Spartacus likely realized that he was fighting a losing war all along. Had he and his followers decided to march through the Alps, many of them would have likely found their deaths before reaching their homelands. Had he decided to march on Rome, even after taking it, he would have been ultimately defeated, as there were dozens of legions throughout the Roman Republic, led by ambitious generals who would have inevitably avenged their defeat sooner or later. But most importantly, during the Third Servile War, the Romans showed the quality that made them rise above the rest and eventually create an empire that would survive for over a thousand years. Despite their hubris and tendency to underestimate some of their enemies, the Romans demonstrated their unyielding perseverance when it mattered the most. Spartacus's end goal and motives for starting the rebellion have been a topic of heated debate since the moment he and his fellow gladiators escaped the school of Batiatis in Capua. Yet over 2000 years after the end of the Third Servile War, there is no established consensus among historians as to what Spartacus was trying to achieve and there will likely never be one. Of course, one could argue that the slaves who rebelled did so out of pure desperation and hopelessness, yet such explanation ignores the complexity of the political situation in Rome at the time or provides any insight as to what the rebels were trying to achieve. 
The seemingly contradictory tactical decisions made by the servile leaders also do not help in providing answers to these questions. Nevertheless, in modern days, Spartacus has become the face of the impoverished, trying to fight their way against the system in search of justice and liberty. For this reason, Spartacus's name was often used in propaganda during the Cold War. To this day, many factories, sports teams, and companies bear the name of Spartacus in former Eastern Bloc countries. Karl Marx designated Spartacus as one of his personal heroes and saw him as somewhat of an ancient communist revolutionary, describing him as a representative of the ancient proletariat. But is there any validity to his view? Can Spartacus be described as a leader of a revolution? Is it possible that he was trying to overthrow the Senate and abolish slavery in Rome? In reality, the depiction of Spartacus as a freedom fighter is a highly romanticized view that emerged in the minds of people who lived centuries after his death. If we were to look to the ancient sources to find support for this claim, we would find that neither Plutarch nor any of his contemporaries even considered the possibility that Spartacus was looking to reform the Roman Republic and bring justice to the lower classes. Also, the Romans were not the only culture practicing slavery at the time. Most ancient societies practiced slavery of some sort, and undoubtedly many of the men who joined Spartacus's cause came from communities where slavery was not seen as something evil. Furthermore, examining the events of the Third Servile War would further contradict this view. Firstly, the breakaway from the House of Batiatas was a very localized event. Revolutions are highly coordinated efforts with many participants who plan their course of action long before they rise up in arms. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that there were people aware of Spartacus's plan to escape outside of the school of Batiatas. The gladiator breakout was an uneventful occurrence, similar to many others before it, and the only reason which allowed it to grow as much as it did was the turbulent political situation in Rome and the negligent oversight of Roman politicians. Furthermore, a detail that is often overlooked when examining the Third Servile War is the fact that Spartacus was picking and choosing what kind of slaves to recruit into his ranks. There is an easy explanation for why the rebels spent so much time in the southern parts of the Italian peninsula, and it is the same as the explanation for why the revolt started there in the first place. The provinces of Lucania, Campania, and Apulia were the most rural areas of Italy, where the majority of the region's agriculture was located, with an abundance of slaves who worked in that field. Spartacus was not interested in freeing city slaves, as they were generally not physically fit men and could offer no useful skills when it came to warfare. Finally, Spartacus was in no way less cruel than his former overlords. His troops sacked several Roman cities, killed thousands of men, among whom undoubtedly many civilians, and would have likely ravaged the Italian countryside for much longer had they not been stopped. Plutarch defends Spartacus in regards to the sacking of Roman cities, claiming that it was more likely Crixus who initiated the violence and that the Thracian had no control over the situation. But regardless, these are not the actions of an army of freedom fighters, but rather a mob of raiders seeking to enrich themselves on the backs of innocents. The ancient sources also tell us of an instance where Roman soldiers were forced to fight each other to the death after being captured by Spartacus's men. If Spartacus's ultimate goal was to reform Roman society and bring justice to the impoverished, why would his men put others in the very condition that they were trying to avoid? In conclusion, it is likely that so far we have been unable to determine the end goal of the rebellion simply because there never was one. If the rebels sought to overthrow the Senate, they had their opportunity to march on Rome after defeating the consular armies a second time. If they were seeking to escape the borders of the Roman Republic, they had the chance to do so while being in Cisalpine Gaul. The lack of decisiveness of the rebel commanders may not have been caused by military ineptitude, but rather by pressures from internal factions within the rebellion, all seeking a different course of action, which ultimately led to the split between Spartacus and Crixus and their separate defeats. Spartacus is often grouped with the likes of Hannibal Barca and Vercingetorix as one of the greatest enemies of Rome. Similar to these figures, he ferociously fought the Romans and managed to achieve victories over arguably the greatest military power of the ancient world. Yet just like these other ambitious generals, Spartacus will forever remain on the losing side of history, coming to his demise when faced with the full strength of the Roman military machine, without an opportunity to shape the world in his view for the future generations.